Going into Blue Thumb, I had already recorded lots of material. Um, though it was very jammy, it was just whatever was flowing through my head at the time would, would come out. And I was also recording it onto my laptop, straight onto my laptop, so it had this really kind of whiny hiss sound to it that I'm sure a lot of people that have tried recording straight to computers are, uh, are aware of. I decided to invest in a in a nice microphone and I bought the Shure SM7B which is the microphone I'm using right now and I started off on it and I wanted to make something really pretty and clean sounding compared to what I had made before so I just took my time uh, going track by track I had already written a good amount of the song going into it so I just had time to really add the backgrounds and the oohs and the ahs. Once I was done with it, um, I was really, really proud of it and surprised that, that it was me on these tracks making these noises. Sometime over the winter, I decided that I had been playing too much music by myself and I needed to surround myself with more musicians. So I decided to put on an open mic at my parents' house, they have this great big living room that I thought would just be perfect for for live music. The sound really reverberates nicely in it. And um, so I called up the only musician friends I knew. It was uh, Ryan Loveland, the guy who lived down the street, and, um, and Ariana, this girl I had met in a restaurant who played piano, and asked them to come play. And um, and I had some friends there. I remember Devin played. Um, my friend Willow played with Ariana for one song. I would hold open mics every couple weeks or so, and the same crew of people would always show up. But we would get new musicians every few weeks, and after a while we were sort of drawing from a decent-sized pool. Um, Zach Sprague started playing every week, and uh, Jason Brown started playing. Noah would be there, Noah Lefebvre. Ruth Hayden played, Pat Cochran. And um, pretty soon we had a cool thing going that, uh, that people wanted to go to. I got asked to be in my first band by Tyler Allen. Tyler and I had gone to elementary school together, and even back then, I remember him being ridiculous at the drums. But he asked me to go over to his parents' house and, uh, and jam out. He said he had a lead guitarist and a bassist already set, and he wanted to get the band rolling. So I showed up, and I was ridiculously nervous because I had never played with anybody, and I was very uh, unconfident in my skills. But, you know, he gave me some lyric sheets, and we played mostly his music, and it just it clicked. We had our first show that summer out of the garage of the lake house I was living in. And the crowd consisted of half my friends and half just neighbors that had heard the music and wandered by. Um, there were lots of kids there, as I remember. But the uh, the set itself was was pretty funny. There's a lot of 
long, jammy songs and a couple songs that we didn't really know how to finish, so they just they just kind of puttered out. But we did have we did have a couple good, solid songs, and uh, and it seemed like everybody really enjoyed themselves. Jack and I hit it off right from the start, from the first practice we had during a break. We got talking about the band Wilco, and Jack could tell that I was a big Wilco fan just based on how I sang and how I wrote my songs, and he himself was a pretty huge Wilco fan as well. He came to one of the last open mics that we had and uh, played with me on a couple songs that he didn't even know. And that's one thing that Jack is really good at, is just adding what is necessary to music, feeling it out. But the thing that I liked most about Jack when I first met him was that he was adamant that he was going to make music his life. He was certain. And I felt that way too, and I had had people tell me that before, but I didn't really believe anybody but Jack. He just had this something in his eye that said, you know, I'm not kidding, I want to do this. And uh, and I knew very shortly after I met him that I needed to stick close to this guy. It seemed like just as Dirty Seed was getting off the ground, it sort of fell apart. Tom uh, was nowhere to be found and Jack had to go back to school in Burlington for a year. Tyler and I we're faced with this decision of do we keep playing or do we find new band members? And um, Jack had given us his word that he would he would come back to the band after after he did school and he uh, he seemed very serious about it. So Tyler and I just decided to start playing him and I. I had little experience in playing out. And with Tyler, I played shows in Keene and Portsmouth, Dover, you know, bars, house shows. And I got a lot more comfortable playing an electric guitar and playing my own songs, really, in front of people. One night over that same summer that I was living in the lake house, I had a conversation with my friend Kelsey. And I said, man, wouldn't that be awesome if we could have a, a show or a festival of some sort over in the park? And Kelsey, who worked in the park at the time, said, yeah, talk to my boss, the park ranger. And unofficially, that's what got the gears in motion on the festival. We weren't actually locked into the festival until we got the special use permit approved by the state and that was the beginning of September and the festival was slotted for October 9th. So we had a month to book bands, sell tickets, figure out the food, find artists. It was incredibly chaotic and um, and I don't understand how it happened really sometimes, but we did have an army of volunteers. They just kept coming out of the woodwork, and I didn't know what to do with most of them because I had never taken on anything this size before. 
My sister Katrina became the co-organizer of the festival and took on the roles of general enthusiasm and public relations. Katrina could talk to strangers and really convey how excited she was about the festival, where I was extremely introverted and could not talk at all about the festival to strangers, besides in the most dry and scientific way. So she was a huge addition to the team. Noah Lefebvre took on the role of sound technician. Him and I had become very good friends over the summer, and he was just on the next level, musically speaking. He was a great performer, but also understood the science of sound. On the day of the festival, it was blue skies and wind. Lots of wind. Stuff was blowing all over the place. It was mostly a family crowd. The UNH homecoming was taking place on the same day, so the young crowd wasn't completely in attendance, but there were kids all over the place. And it was really a beautiful scene. The foliage was about at its peak. And... Um, the music was just fantastic. Towards the middle of the following winter, I started to feel very stagnant. We were getting pummeled by snow at the time, and I was spending my days watching movies and playing darts with my roommates. So I decided to start in on my next album, uh, More. The idea behind More was to put the listener in a different uh, mind space. So in addition to the music, I added lots of sounds, real life sounds, ocean surf, cars, um, construction workers. And um, I recorded it the same way as Blue Thumb, track by track. But this time I decided I wanted to master it to get a more professional sound out of it. So I teamed up again with Noah Lefebvre and um, he was working in Keene at the time and I was living in Portsmouth. So. We would uh, bounce ideas back and forth. And the final product was something special. It was definitely half an hour of being in a different world. With the physical production of more, I wanted to create an artifact that people would really want to hang on to after they had ripped the music to their computer. So I ordered cardboard CD cases and two stamps, one large and one small. And the stamp process was I would stamp the front with the large, the spine with the small, the two inside pockets with the large, and then I would do the CD with the small stamp. I also included a lyric sheet that had artwork by my good friend Alex Keon. I released more on March 21st, 2011. I sent 30 or so copies out to local publications to be reviewed or mentioned or something, and I heard back from one of them. I had the release show at my parents' house where the first open mics were held, and I had Tyler playing with me all night and guest performers for just about every song, and the room was overflowing with people that night. And, um... It's nights like that that remind you why you're putting in all the work in the first place. For the second year of the Patuckaway Festival, Noah became the co-organizer. 
we had learned a lot from the first year, and we were definitely eager to improve on it in a bunch of different ways. With five months to plan it out instead of one, we could address each part of the festival. And we had a bunch of volunteers again. The volunteers were indescribable in how selfless they were, how much time they dedicated and in the end, we raised attendance, we paid each band uh, fairly, and really legitimized the festival. And shortly after the festival, I began recording Heavy Things with Strings. One, two, three, four. I begin recording by assembling my gear. This starts with connecting my computer to a power source outside of the room I'm recording in. I then run a six-pin firewire cable from the computer, under the door, and into my preamp. An XLR cable connects the preamp to the microphone. Additionally, I would usually set up my video camera on a tripod somewhere in the room where I'm recording. Next, I tune my guitars in cello. The cello takes a considerably longer period of time to tune, especially if I haven't used it in a while. After that, I try to eliminate any unwanted sounds the microphone might pick up. This usually consists of letting everybody in the house or apartment know that I'm going to record, but I also shut off lights and fans. While recording in my parents' basement, I would ask that people avoid wearing shoes if possible, because footsteps would sometimes make their way through the ceiling. My recording process is very simple. I position the microphone where I want it, start recording, shut the door, and play music. The problem is that it takes a very long time to record a song this way. Besides having 8 to 12 individual tracks on any given song, I also don't know what I want it to sound like when I start recording. I usually lay down the rhythm guitar in a rough lead vocal track. After that, the experimental layering begins. I assemble and disassemble vocal, synthesizer, cello, and guitar tracks till I found the right combination of sounds. After I've found something that clicks, I re-record the vocals and begin the more detailed mixing. If recording goes well, I'll have a solid foundation for a song in four to seven hours. The next day I'll record for two to four more hours, and after a few more days of tinkering, I'll have a finished song. For Heavy Things With Strings, I spent around 120 hours recording. I took a step backwards for more and aimed for a simpler, less gritty sound. I decided to focus mainly on vocal layering and cello arrangements. When the recording was finished, I turned to Joe Viziano. Joe had recorded a demo for Fire Tower and had shown interest in mixing my next solo album. Joe pulled off the final mixing for Heavy Things during a full-time internship at a recording studio in New York. With the final mixes complete, Noah Lefebvre once again stepped in. In addition to digitally mastering the album, Noah also transferred the mixes to tape. This step was integral in giving Heavy Things the warm, airy sound it has. And even though it was riddled with complications, Noah came through on time. 
For the album artwork, I used a painting I purchased from my hiking buddy, Joel Kudelowski. So that's how I make music. Slowly, carefully, and with lots of help. I don't see myself becoming well-known or famous, but that's not the point. When you make music you believe in, you connect with people. You say things they've been feeling for years, but they've never known how to put it into words. And when you connect like this with someone, the rest of the world doesn't seem so heavy.